When looking over Kyle Busch's Xfinity Series career, there is nothing to see but complete and total domination. So much so that for over a decade, fans have begged NASCAR to ban him in order for the series regulars to stand a chance. And it's not hard to see where that argument comes from, as with a staggering 102 wins, he has over double the amount of the next best driver in the all-time wins list, Mark Martin. Additionally, the Xfinity Series is meant to be a development league, comparable as Indy Lights is to IndyCar or F2 is to F1. Except in those series, and in nearly every other form of motorsports around the world, the drivers in the Premier Series never drop down to race in the ones below them, especially if they already essentially graduated from them. But for Bush, who in his 2004 rookie season won five races in the then coincidentally named Bush Series and earned himself a cup ride with Hendrick Motorsports for the following year, his actual developmental time in the series was only the first page to what would make up his illustrious and record-destroying career in it. And even still, despite his numerous wins and total domination over the years to come, to this day he's only won a single Xfinity Series championship. As to why he's come up short in each of the other 18 years he's competed in the series, it's not at all because of poor luck or late season falloffs. First of all, Kyle's only ever raced full-time in two Xfinity Series seasons, both in his rookie campaign of 2004 and his championship winning campaign of 2009. He did, however, start up at one race in 2006. Throughout the late 2000s and early 2010s, Kyle would still enter between 20 to 30 Xfinity races per year, really only being stopped from running the full schedule because on some race weekends, the Xfinity race would be across the country from the cup race, and some other times his team wanted to put their young development drivers in the car. Even then, with Kyle only competing in 29 out of 35 races in 2010, he managed to come home third in the standings with an astonishing 13 wins, 22 top 5s, and 25 top 10s. Worse yet for the state of the series, the only drivers to score more points than him were cup drivers as well, them being that year's champion Brad Keselowski and the runner-up Carl Edwards, and thus Justin Allgaier, who finished fourth with a single win, was really the highest finishing quote-unquote series regular. Such cup series oppression was not at all unusual in the Xfinity Series points back then, as Keselowski would be the fifth consecutive full-time cup driver to win the title, meaning that a true development driver hadn't won since Martin Truex Jr. back in 2005. At this point, NASCAR wasn't having it anymore, and beginning with the 2012 season, they would only allow drivers to compete for points in one series, effectively banning all full-time cup drivers from stealing any more Xfinity Series championships. That ruling is stuck to the present day, with NASCAR even doubling down by limiting the number of Xfinity races the cup regulars can start in. First limiting drivers with five or more years of full-time cup experience at 10 starts in 2017, then to seven in 2018, and then finally to just five in 2020 for drivers with even three years of cup experience. That said, Kyle Busch will foreseeably retire with only one championship in the series he scored over 100 wins in. And now it's time to head back to his triumphant 2009 season to see just how well it went for NASCAR's ultimate bushwhacker. Ah uh, yes, 2009, the first year I began keeping up with NASCAR, and the first year since his 2004 rookie campaign that Kyle Busch would look to endure the entire schedule of the then Nationwide Series. Though quite impractical with five race weekends, including an abysmal three-in-a-row stretch in June, seeing the Cup and Nationwide Series races on the opposite side of the country just one day apart, the challenge of running both series full-time had been completed by multiple drivers over the past few years. The defending champ of Clint Boyer and the two before him of Carl Edwards and Kevin Harvick were all able to pull it off, as were a handful of their competitors who came up short of the top spot. It wasn't a matter of if it was possible, it was more so a matter of how well a driver could handle those unfortunate weekends and still perform well in both of their races. And of course, no matter how intense the battle for the Nationwide Championship was, the real money was in the Cup Series, so if push came to shove, Cup races would take priority for all of the drivers attempting both. But in this season opener at Daytona, these problems appear to be miles down the road. Tony Stewart has won three of the last four in Daytona. Can he hold off his former teammate, Kyle Busch? Carl Edwards is hungry behind him, and Clint Boyer, the champ, in fourth spot. Tony's smart enough. He knows he can't get too far away from those guys, that they'll get a big run on him, and then he won't be able to hold them off. Right here, it's going to happen. If it's going to it's happen right here, it'll do it on the straightaway. You see the guys just lining play. up behind him. He's obviously guarding the inside. If they're going to pass him, he's going to have to be to the high side. You see Carl Edwards is just not right there. He's going to lose him up. He's going to lose him up. He's going to lose him up. Kyle he's got him loose. Gives him the shove and comes on the inside. Tony is digging back on the outside. Oh, wow. What, what a they, job. They Tony Stewart. So far yeah. the whole Here comes Where? Carl Edwards to the outside of Kyle Busch. He's going to be in second. He's got to run. Tony Stewart will come down. Bush 
Christian Biffle. So Tony Stewart for the fourth time is a winner at Daytona. Sorry for the miserable video quality there. That's just how it is for some of the older races. But anyway, it was the defending race winner, Tony Stewart, in a one-off deal with Hendrick Motorsports, who was able to hold off a hard-charging Kyle Busch and others en route to victory. And looking at the rest of the names in the finishing order, this race might as well have just been another bud shoot of our cup practice session, because nine of the top ten finishers were full-time cup drivers. The highest finisher, whose main focus was the Nationwide Series, wasn't even a development driver either. It was Jason Keller, a longtime series veteran and 10 time winner who was at the tail end of his racing career. Rather, the best of the then Cup Series prospects was a 12th place finisher, Michael McDowell, which is even a stretch to say considering he ran over half the Cup schedule the year prior for Michael Waltrip racing. Yeah, that was the state of the Nationwide Series in 2009. In the next race at Auto Club, the pack racing aspect was out of the window, and so were the chances of unexpected variables getting in the way of a Kyle Busch win. After a record-tying 10-win season the previous year despite sitting out for five races, Kyle Busch had already shown that he was at another level of bushwhacking. I mean, it's in his name. It won't happen again, I promise, but Kyle put on a show in the Stater Brothers 300, leading all but seven of the 150 laps on his path to win number one of 2009. However, the next week at his home track of Las Vegas, he did not have the same fortune. At all. On just lap 22, Bush got loose on the apron of the track and completely lost control, backing hard into the outside wall and collecting the pole sitter of Scott's speed. As far as the race itself, this was far from the only incident of the day. In fact, it was already the third of the race and what would pan out to be a 12-caution wreckfest that now typically calm, cookie-cutter track. But back then, it was anything but because as demonstrated by Bush, the cars were becoming a real pain to handle. We're talking about Brad Keselowski, Doc, who was involved in an earlier uh, incident. Brad, what happened? Uh, you know, the, the 20 cars spun out there and uh, side by side. And these cars uh, at this style of racetrack, just too line sensitive, too out of control. And if you're not right in the line, you just, you're going to wreck. And, uh, you know, the one car is right beside me. We lifted and we both, uh, we both got sideways from lifting. You just, the way these cars drive. So, um. Since the series began racing there in 1997, the inaugural race held the record for the most cautions, with 8 total up until 2007 when there were suddenly 12, then 13 the year after, and 12 again in 2009. As stated by young Brad Kozolowski, the cars had become far too aero-sensitive on the intermediates. So throughout the recent seasons, it was not uncommon to see just as much if not more wrecking in the mile and a half than on the super speedways and short tracks. With Bush still sitting 5th in points, he put together a solid race the next time out of Bristol. Well, on paper, that is, because his sixth place result that day certainly does not tell the full story. With under 50 to go in the 300 lap event, Bush was still out front after having led a controlling 156 laps. And under caution for the ninth time, the leaders headed down pit road for what would likely be their final stop of the day. Just one more stop, our car's already in the lead, just don't do anything crazy here, oh, oh no. Having to restart in the back due to the equipment violation, Bush charged up through the field and luckily avoided this big pileup but ultimately didn't have enough time to get past all his Cup Series competitors up front, and handed the win off to Kevin Harvick. Harvick, who at that point had raced in all the Nationwide Series events, vaulted up to second in points right behind Carl Edwards, but the 2006 champ was not intending to run full-time that year, so realistically the biggest threat to Edwards was Kyle Busch, who despite choking the win, even a top five, was able to slip into third in points. After an off weekend for the series, Busch came back in full force for the O'Reilly 300 at Texas. There he went on from the pole to dominate the race, leading 178 of the 200 laps on his way to his second win of the season. Better yet for the 18 team was that the points leader of Edwards had finally suffered problems of his own. After a solid race of running right around the top five, with five laps to go, he was battling hard with Joey Logano when Logano got loose and pushed Edwards high up the track and into the outside wall. Edwards pancaked the whole passenger side of his car and cut his right front tire, forcing him to come down pit road and relegating him to a miserable 18th place finish two laps down. Just like that, his comfortable points lead coming in was chopped down almost entirely as leaving the race, only a mere 38 points separated him from Kyle Busch. Now it was really on, and unless something catastrophic happened to either team, the championship was already set up to be a one-on-one -on -one battle between the two bushwhacking titans, as the next best full-time driver in points was Braun Racing's Jason Leffler, who albeit very consistent, did not have the speed to be a weekly contender. If there was one driver who could potentially shock the world, though, it was the up-and-coming junior motorsports driver Brad Keselowski. The year before, in his first full season behind Dale Jr.'s number 88, 
Brown was able to pick up two wins and a third place points finish. Now in 2009, he was off to a bit of a sophomore slump with incidents in every one of the first four races and not a single top 10 finish until his third place run in Texas. But most of that was simply due to bad luck and the parts that weren't were quickly cleaned up by the Cup Series prospect, as in the next two races he would match his Texas result, making three third place finishes in a row. Those next two races were also significant to the points battle between Bush and Edwards, as though both the drivers fared well in Nashville, with Bush coming home second and Edwards fifth. In Phoenix, the tides turned once again. There, both of them would face issues early in the race, as first with Bush, his car would become insufferably tight due to a slow leaking right front tire, causing him to drop from the lead to outside the top 10 in just 15 laps. Forced to make an unscheduled green flag pit stop when even more issues arose, Bush was at least able to get both of his laps back and recover to a respectable 10th place finish, all things considered. However, Edwards would not be able to come back from his many problems that day. Though unrelated to his poor finish, his clean driving streak came to an end on just lap 28 when right after an early race restart, he completely dumped the slower number 99 of Michael Waltrip, who had chosen to stay out under caution. Then, in what would perhaps be considered a dose of karma, Edwards began reporting shortly after that his engine was sounding off. He continued leading the race up until lap 97 when a caution for debris finally provided the 60 crew an opportunity to look under the hood. But their findings were nothing positive, and on lap 114, Edwards was finally forced to go behind the wall for repairs. His team was eventually able to get him back out on track, but unfortunately for that day's pole sitter and dominant driver of the first half, he wound up finishing in 33rd, and for the first time that season, second in points to Kyle Busch. Surprisingly, the next week at Talladega saw relatively few issues for the championship contenders, as both drivers led their fair share of laps, but were unable to be up front when it mattered the most with Bush crossing the line in 10th and Edwards in 13th. Then in the 9th round at Richmond, we would finally get to see the two go head-to-head -head for the win. Thanks, guys. Glad to have you with us, folks. Great Friday night NASCAR action under the lights here at Richmond International Raceway. Glad to have you with us as the green flag waves. Kyle Busch sneaking a peek inside of Kenseth in turn three. Look, he's got some sponsorship there to keep him going. Possible lead change. Here's a surprise. Uh, Kyle Busch getting racy early. Yeah, Matt Kenseth probably not going to contest this spot too much right here at the beginning of the race. Here comes Kyle Busch. He figured, figures if he's going to get a shot at Mike Bliss, he needs to do it early. He's up on the outside now. Well, remember, these tires well, are fast early, too, Andy. You gotta Bush, get her done quick. He drove that car in on the outside real hard. It looks like Bliss got just a little bit loose. And really, that's probably the way his car is set up. He's probably got it pretty free. Takes a few laps to come in. Great battle for the lead in Richmond. Carl Edwards has been trying to get underneath Kyle Busch to take it away. The top two drivers in points are the top two on the racetrack, and Carl has yet to lead a lap tonight. That will change as they come off turn four here on lap 158. So we got a good mix of cars with tires, some without. See Kyle Busch now jumping to the outside of Carl Edwards. Boy, Carl knew that was going to happen, and he's just got to... Yeah, he knew it was coming, but what do you do? I mean, he's just got to race him hard right here. And this is where the top side of that track is so important. Let's see what happens off this turn four right now, because this is where the track opens up, and Kyle can get away from him. There he goes. Kyle just made a great pass on Edward. He just motored away coming up out of turn four, now pulls him by two car lengths. Kyle Busch just got too much of a lead there on that start. Carl Edwards just driving his guts out, not able to close on him. In both races a year ago, the driver who led the most laps did not win it here. But tonight, Kyle Busch has led four times now for 116 laps, and Kyle Busch will come out of turn four and get win number three in 2009. Unbelievable. Man, that is freaking awesome, dude. Thank you, bud. Kevin Harvey drives up to a top five. Good fifth call, Radcliffe. You won the race, buddy. Good job. Thanks, guys. Woo! In the end, it was Kyle Busch who came out on top after having led 115 of the 250 laps that day, while Edwards settled for second after leading 71 laps of his own. And still, the championship lead belonged to Kyle Busch, who had built up an 82-point cushion. 
But another driver who led a good portion of the laps that night with 51 total was Mike Bliss, the 2002 Truck Series champion and a full-time Nationwide Series regular behind the wheel of the Phoenix Racing number 1 car. After scoring a runner-up finish at Dover with the team the year prior, Bliss was continuing to outperform his equipment in 2009 with three top 10s already and a great race developing at Richmond. But unfortunately for him, while running in 4th with 39 to go, track bar breakage would put an end to his day and relegate him to a 33rd place finish. Though it was certainly a heartbreaker for the number one team, they wouldn't let it get the best of them and instead only continued on with their Richmond speed over the next two races, where at Darlington they would come home 7th, and at Charlotte, they would get the win. For both Bliss and Phoenix Racing, this wouldn't have been a long time coming, as Bliss hadn't won a nationwide race since his first career win with Joe Gibbs Racing, also at Charlotte back in 2004, and Phoenix Racing hadn't seen victory lane since Johnny Sauter got done in Milwaukee back in 2005. However, from a team perspective, this one was definitely overshadowed in the years to come by their Miracle Cup Series one with Brad Keselowski just a few weeks prior to Talladega. And similar to that win, Mike Bliss didn't exactly get it done without some shenanigans. See, while running in 5th place as the final round of green flag pit stops went underway, Bliss's team opted to stay out as long as they could, hoping for a caution due to incident or perhaps due to the closing in rain clouds. And before they were even in danger of losing too much speed on old tires, the former would happen when the 81 of Kevin Hamlin got into the outside of wall and came to a stop on track. At that point, only one other car had to make their green flag pit stop, that being the 62 of Brendan Gaughan, who was a lap down before the pit cycle began. So both Bliss and Gaughan, who had received their lucky dog, came down the pits under caution and would restart the tail end of the field with all the previous leaders in front of them. But because they had all just gotten their laps back from Bliss, they were actually at the end of the lead lap meaning that if Bliss passed them on the restart, it wouldn't be for position, but rather to put them back a lap down. Yeah, it was kind of a mess, but basically now it was a duel between Bliss and Gon for the win, so long as the race stayed green till the end. On the restart, Gon gave it everything he had, even leading for two laps, but after a hard-fought battle, Bliss eventually took it back and held on until lap 169 when the caution came back out, this time to end the race because of rain. And so, it was Mike Bliss who stole the win away from the third-place finisher and driver who led the most laps that day, Kyle Busch, by means of a car with top 5 speed and a whole lot of pit strategy luck. Additionally, this race, the 11th of the season, was the first one all season long to be won by a driver who was not also full-time in the Cup Series. And in fact, over the rest of the season, the only other non-full-time Cup driver who was able to win a nationwide race was Brad Keselowski, who at that point was already Cup Series winner, though. Keselowski didn't just win once either, but actually four times and route to a complete season turnaround from a slow start in the first handful of races. The junior motorsports driver would end up finishing third in points, matching his result from the year prior, but with much improved consistency, not only doubling his number of wins from 2 to 4, but also doubling his top fives from 11 to a very impressive 22. This dramatic improvement to an already solid 2008 season was what inevitably caught the eye of Roger Penske and landed him a full-time ride in the Cup Series for the next year. But back to the main focus of this video, the championship battle between Kyle Busch and Carl Edwards. Well, believe it or not, I've actually already covered the gist of it. Once Busch took the points lead coming out of the spring Phoenix race, he never looked back, and with no chase or playoff format to stand in his way, he made off with the championship at Homestead, even winning the race to seal the deal. It was certainly no easy task for Busch, as if his consistency faltered even a bit too much at any point, Edwards would have been right there to pounce back. But when it was all said and done, Bush simply edged out Edwards in just about every measurable statistic, as though both tied with 30 top 10s, it was Bush who scored two more top 5s with 25 total, and four more wins with 9 total. Towards the end of the season, the battle actually shifted away from Bush and Edwards to Edwards and Keselowski. As in the final standings, Keselowski, with his incredible late season consistency, was able to reel in Edwards just a 108 point gap, while Edwards ended with 210 points between himself and Bush. While those three were at least somewhat in league with one another and able to contend for wins on a weekly basis, the same cannot be said about the rest of the series' full-timers. Fourth in points was Jason Leffler, who with a mere eight top fives compared to the top three drivers, never came close to throwing his name in the championship hunt, and finished over 1,100 points back from Bush. The same can be said about the only full-time winner that season besides the top three, Mike Bliss, who with his lone wins, seven top fives, and 15 top tens, finished even 465 points behind a Leffler to land fifth overall. So there you have it, the only year Kyle Busch won and likely ever will win a nationwide and now Xfinity Series championship. And pretty much as expected in a prime season of bushwhacking, it wasn't the most entertaining for fans of the series looking to see rising talents improve their craft and win races. 
It really doesn't seem that long ago, but it was a different time for the sport back then, which really makes me appreciate the state of the Xfinity series as it is now even more. There's still plenty of opportunity for young drivers to learn from racing with Cup Series veterans, but not at the cost of losing their rides to them and or going winless to them. But that is all for today's video. I hope you all really enjoyed it, and if you did, please make sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more videos just like these. Between now and the next time I upload, I'll have moved into college, so hopefully I'll be normal with the upload schedule still. Uh, still uploading about once every one or two weeks, hopefully. But as the school year picks up, there might be some times when I'm uh, unable to do that. So if that's the case, I'll make sure to let you guys know what's going on through the community post, which I've met, uh, yet to make any use of. Uh, but yeah, that's all I've got to say for today. So until next time, peace out.